இந்த முதல் அமர்வின் இறுதியாக தேநீர் இடைவேளைக்கு முந்தைய மூன்றாவது உரையும் திரைப்படங்கள் குறித்த தொடர்பாற்றின் ஆய்வுகளை பற்றியது அந்த உரையத்தை கிருஷ்ணமூர்த்தி அவர்களை அழைக்கிறேன் தொடக்க கால தென்னிந்திய சினிமா தமிழ் திரைப்படங்கள் முதலியவற்றில் ஆய்வுனை மேற்கொண்டு வரும் சுஜித் சுகித் கிருஷ்ணமூர்த்தி நாடக ஆசிரியர் தமிழ் சுமந்தல் முதலியாரின் நூல் நூலினை காக்கி எக்ஸ்பீரியன்சஸ் இன் தமிழ் என்ற தலைப்பில் ஆங்கிலத்தில் மொழிபெயர்த்துள்ளார் இத்துடன் த மிஸ்ஸிங் பிலிம் ரீல்ஸ் ஆஃப் தமிழ் சினிமா என்ற விரிவான ஆவண படத்தினையும் இயக்கியுள்ளார் திரைப்படம் நாடகம் குறித்து தொடர்ச்சியாக எழுதியிருக்கிறார் மேலும் அந்த இன்ட்ரடக்ஷன் டு ஸ்டுடியோஸ் ஆஃப் ஏழி தமிழ் டக் நைன்டீன் தேர்ட்டி ஒன் டு நைன்டீன் ஃபிஃப்டி என்ற இவரது நூல் விரைவில் வெளிவர உள்ளது சுகித் கிருஷ்ணன் good morning to everyone present here today 10 years ago i met theodore baskaran for the first time right here at the roja mutaya library later that day we took our first photograph together in front of an sb subalakshmi banner just right here at the entrance since then i've had umpteen moments of happiness over the years as i have discussed not just cinema but also several aspects of my own life with him Tilaka Amma has been an amazing host and in a small sense, the Baskarans are like family to me. Thank you, Sundar sir, for giving me the opportunity to speak on the writings and contribution of Theodore Baskaran to furthering research and study of early Tamil cinema. I also want to use this as an opportunity to thank the support staff of RMRL, Mala Ma'am and Manikanda Subbu in particular, who have helped me access some of the important material in the library for study. Thank you. Uh, so due to constraints of time, uh, this presentation will be a slightly abridged version of uh, the detailed paper. So I'm just touching on the important points of the paper. Okay. Okay. Uh, when any work is written on an individual's lifetime contribution to any sphere of public influence, one needs to take into account the impact of their work, the challenging circumstances under which the work was created, the resultant impact which the completed work had on society or on peers in that respective field, the emergence, acknowledgement and subsequent recognition of the individual as a leader in that sphere of society, and most importantly, the potential for further scope of the accepted and completed works of that individual by future generations. This paper tries to highlight important works, ideas and contributions of writer-scholar Theodore Baskarin to Tamil film studies and the scope for furthering those ideas into the future, going into the future. So I'll just rush through uh, most of the early aspects of the paper and I'll try to spend maximum time at the most important thing, which I think is the scope. The message bearers. Uh, and until the early 80s, see, you, th there are two, two ways of looking at this. You have a study, uh, uh, see, up and uh, until the early 80s, Tamil cinema has al al already emerged as a part and parcel of daily Indian life. It's invaded the entertainment and social and political space of the masses. So what happens is, by this time, whatever work on cinema's origins that had been done up and until this point was largely done by commercial film journalists who, who cater to the popular narratives. And uh, even the few film journals up to this point, which had chronicled the events of the origins of cinema, did not see the larger perspective of the society's fabric and thinking at that time. But if you take the approach of what Baskaran did, so what he does is, in the message bearers, he does not simply talk about the origins of Tamil cinema in his book. So what he instead takes us is, he goes back to... Yeah, yeah so what he goes back, he goes to the last quarter of the 19th century, and he takes a series of 
events that were happening in parallel. For instance, he takes the resurgence of the stage as, as a popular entertainment form, and then he takes the role played by a rich and educated lightest cast of individuals who are slowly coming into politics. And then there was a parallel thread where there were calls for social reform. And then there's the technological evolution of tools of mass communication and entertainment forms. And then there's another thread uh, where you have the rise and growth of the silent cinema, uh, which subsequently leads to the talkies. So what Bhaskaran does here is he integrates the parallel and narration of all these developments. And this is where he differentiates it. The earlier writers have not seen the larger perspective of the society's fabric and thinking when they documented the origins of Tamil cinema. But what Bhaskaran does is he integrates all these threads and he puts that in the perspective of the Indian nationalistic movement and freedom struggle. So uh, Bhaskaran has accessed popular sources like the Tamil Nadu State Archives, the Hindu Archives, National Film Archives of India. He's read several books uh, and he's interviewed several, several of the individuals. So this is the 70s. So most of the individuals who had been part of the nationalistic movement or on early cinema were then aging. So he's gone and interviewed and spoken to several of these individuals and technicians, artists, and political leaders who had played their part in the struggle. But to a, to a certain extent, one might consider these things as part of traditional research. But what immensely differentiates the message bearers from previous forms of research is the point number 10. So where he says, he accesses what I would like to call the unknown man's colloquial nationalistic songbook. These books were almost unregistered. They were very much error prone. And they were very, very informal in presentation. He uses these anonymous sources, most of these anonymous sources. And the, there were a lot of plagiarism also in these sources. They were printed in local presses. But the thing is that the, pers the people, the anonymous people or the very small time people who wrote these books really didn't have any intent to take lit literary credit. So plagiarism was really not a major issue there. For them, it was their, it was their role. They, it was their self-satisfaction that they had played a role in the freedom struggle. So Bhaskaran goes to Karakudi, where he meets Roja Mataya Chetiar, a private collector. And uh, he finds these materials, and he studies and uses them for his research. And all of these together combined became what uh, the iconic book, The Message Bearers. And uh, incidentally, uh, this collection, which Roja Mataya Chetiar had collected over the years, was the seed capital of what became this major institution, the Roja Mataya Library. And Bhaskaran was its first director. So the message bearers has become a standard reference work for anyone interested in studying the nationalist movement and early Tamil cinema in South India today. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema, Ashish Rajadaksha and Paul Willeman. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema by Ashish Rajadaksha and Paul Willeman stands today as one of the most comprehensive index and primary reference of Indian cinema. It brought together a bunch of incomplete filmographies, cinephiles, researchers, archivists, and film scholars across the length and breadth of the country. This was in the early 90s. So this was at a time where even researchers and film scholars didn't have access to a lot of the film material, unlike today. So what Ashish Rajadaksha says, in the first edition of uh, writing, Bhaskaran was, played an important contribution in this uh, Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema. He had uh, substantially written the Tamil portion of the book. And uh, what I think is particularly very important is, in those days, the film material was not primarily available. So what Ashish Rajadaksha uh, says, this is particular for the first edition of the book. You grew up with the assumption that not only because the NFAI had only 4 to 6% of Indian films made and that the rest of the films were lost. So you created quite a sophisticated example. And Bhaskaran is a key example of that me methodology for researching Indian films in the presumed absence of the primary material. Subsequently, uh, the book had a second edition uh, in the space of about uh, seven to eight years. By that time, there was a video explosion and uh, a lot more additions were added. There were a few more contributors who came on board uh, the book. It's a major, uh, it's a major uh, work and uh, it has a lot of scope going ahead and uh, which I will discuss later. Uh, the interesting outcome of Bhaskaran's original contribution to this encyclopedia was that he used it to write another largely successful book on Tamil cinema the Eye of the Serpent, which won the Golden Lotus Award from the President of India in the year 96. The Catechist of Kila Arani. So uh, Bhaskaran's works have also read to the rediscovery of a silent era propaganda film. The details are mentioned in the slide, but uh, uh, Ashish Rajadaksha reads Bhaskaran's reference of the Catechist of Kila Arani. This was a, a very problematic film when it was made. 
was a very controversial film and the ICC records of 1928 do have a lot of details on this film. So almost 80 years, this was forgotten in the published con public consciousness. And Ashish Rajadaksha had uh, read Bhaskaran's reference to this film in the message bearers. And uh, he had made some uh, efforts and uh, the details of which are available here. And uh, thankfully the film is now available. The film came from Ireland. Uh, so the most important points here is the film is available today in the online space. It is by no means a regular feature silent film or a documentary, but it is the only known surviving film footage of the silent era period shot in the areas around the Jinji Fort and the rural areas surrounding Velour and Arne. What I think is particularly important about this uh, film is that the film has captured for posterity prevailing agricultural practices of the region and common habits like rural gossip and the village pond being a central hub in the integration of the activities of the villages. This has been shot on film and is available for posterity. Anyone can go and have a look at them. The story of uh, Baskarin has written several books, uh, but I'm trying to touch on some very, very important ones. Uh, and one of them is one of the latest book, uh, his book on SS Vasan. Uh, so here, unlike, uh, so the book is precise and concise and includes the life of SS Vasan and his various facets of pro professional life in chapters of a few pages each. And um, uh, so the book is a very small book. Uh, and uh, Bhaskaran, uh, has, uh, what he's tried to do is, uh, he's written the life of SS Vasan in a few chapters of a few pages each. And uh, there are some places where the Bhaskaran's touch is there. So for instance, he makes a small um, description of Madana Kamarajan where he says, the story would take place in a geographically unspecified place in a period that is uncertain. Anachronisms were part of the plot. This form ac accommodated a lot of entertainment features such as song, dance, fight, magic, chases, and melodrama. So what I think is important is these two lines, what Baskin says, summarizes what most of S.S. Vasan's films are generally about. So you can take this uh, description of Baskin for Madana Kamarajan and very well fit it for Chandraleka. It'll gel with almost any of Vasan's films. Uh, and uh, what, however, what I think is um, particularly important is uh, point number three. Uh, uh, several years ago, it is to Theodore Baskin's own credit that he had rediscovered the government order which resulted in the banning of the film Tyagabhumi. So he's used this government order for the description of several of his works and the details of the government order are Government Order 137879, Home Ministry, dated 2nd May 1944. So this government order does reaffirm that Tyagabhumi was indeed subject to a ban from the British government's perspective. But what I think is particularly important is it runs counter to the populist notion that Tyagabhumi was subject to a ban 22 weeks after its release. So that, that's why I think this document is particularly important. So three weeks after this, uh, this order is issued, uh, there's a, there's a condemnation message in Kalki magazine. Uh, Kalki himself signs the, uh, the condemnation and uh, he condemns uh, the ban of Tiago Bumi. This is uh, the third week of May, 1944. He condemns and uh, says that uh, it is not fair by the British to ban Tiago Bumi. But what I feel is important is SS Vasan's reaction to this ban order has not been documented so far. Uh, Baskaran fails to document how SS Vasan reacted to this government order given that it is well documented that S.S. Vasan was part of a triumvirate, which included writer Kalki Krishnamurti and director K. Subramaniam, who had combined to make Tyagabhumi one of the legacy films of all time. Considering that this, uh, that Baskin found the original government order, uh, it would, I feel that it would have added yet another feature to Baskin's cap if he had found some documents to support Vasan's subsequent views on the ban or what was the subsequent scope of the ban and the outcome of the film post the ban. Uh, Baskaran Society's acknowledgement as an authority in Tamil cinema. So Baskaran was there on the board of the National Film Archives of India, Pune. He was there on the Indian National Film Awards. He's lectured in various universities, including the University of London in Michigan. Uh, he has consulted and shared his views on documentaries on several important personalities, such as P.K. Nair, Eliza Dangan, and K. Subramaniam. But what I think is Baskaran's most important significant role in a small and virtual, uh, virtually forgotten documentary is, uh, is a small time documentary called Pesa Molly by M. Sandamalan. Uh, it is a film based on the silent era period of Tamil cinema. Uh, Baskaran in that documentary takes the viewer visually around the electric theater. 
It's a prominent permanent theater, which was, uh, which was used for screening of silent films. Today, it is the Madras Philatelic Bureau in the post office. And he also shares his views on the first South Indian filmmaker, Arun Adraja Madalayar, and pioneer film exhibitor, Sami Kana Vincent. I think this is the most important uh, aspect. So by this time, you can see that uh, Maskaran has established, uh, time has passed, he's written several books, and he has established himself as an authority. Society has recognized it in multiple forms. And he has virtually become a leader. So now what we have to look at is what is the scope for furthering study of Baskarans on Baskarans' published works and ideas. Um, the first thing is the Indian cinematograph records. One of the major reliable and primary sources of the silent film era, which Baskaran has used extensively, uh, and you can see a lot of references in the message bearers, is the Indian Cinematograph Committee records 1928. So the problem is that primary sources like these usually never interest journalistic writers. So we are actually sitting on a wealth of human knowledge, waiting for stories to be told. But what I think makes the ICC record special is that it just doesn't just tell us about cinema. It tells us about British India, the lives of ordinary British, uh, ordinary Indian citizens of that time, the details of social indicators of economic prosperity, literacy, and financial status of citizens across the length and breadth of the country. And interestingly, I found a small, uh, a small reference. It was a conversation. It was a harmless, non-political conversation while going through the ICC records myself. And I see that the ICC records provide us with non-political perspectives to some of the political questions which we face as a society today. Today, the arrival of the internet has democratized research immensely. Anyone can avail and download these ICC records. They are OCR indexed, and as PDFs, they can be downloaded from various public access libraries across the internet. You can download them from the Internet Archive or from indiancity.ma. Anyone can do that. Next, what? So this is this is a website called indiancine.ma. It is the future of the archive in the online space. That's the way its creators try to position itself. In many ways, this is uh, this is an extension of what Baskaran did for Ashish Rajadaksha's work. So, so the thing is that what is the purpose of an archive? Generally, we we see. That I'm looking at point number four. What is the purpose of an archive? Yeah, purpose of an archive is primarily to store and preserve films in a light material, make them available for future study and research, provide a platform for debate and study. So that should, that's the purpose of an archive. But what Indian cinema.ma tries to do is that, and another uh, major problem that archives face is that they focus most of the energies on preservation. They think from the era of the 80s and 70s, times have changed. They really have not liberalized their approach towards making access an important point. They continue to think on lines and focus most of the energy on preservation. So what this is, uh, what Lawrence Liang says, there was a sense that access is also one of the functions of the film archive, not just preservation. The reason why we started Indian Cine.ma was we were trying to look at the role of the archive in the online space. So uh, Indian, uh, so this is a collaboration with Ashish Rajadaksha, who is the author of Encyclopedia of Indian Cine.ma. Indian Cine.ma does all of this in the virtual space. It's built over Ashish's work, which also includes Baskaran's contributions. So I'm trying to put this in parallel to some of the questions that Baskaran raises in his papers. So one of the questions that he asked, this, this paper was probably written 10 or 15 years ago. And he says, he raises, a, uh, I'm looking at the second, second half of the slide. Baskaran says he raises a very pertinent question to the lack of methodology in Indian film research. Movies are difficult to handle compared to written material. How can historians who are familiar only with print media use film, language of which they are unfamiliar as source material? And particularly, he raises a question, can an image be quoted? So now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring what Indian cinema is today, and I'm trying to see if it may at least partially answer the questions which Bhaskaran has raised. So Indian Cine.ma is a medium that is purely digital for interaction. So it provides a solution to the film handling issue. The website has a placeholder for every Indian movie made. It's sorted by timeline, which could be categorized and filtered across various subcategories and cross linked to various attributes of data associated with the film. The film has, uh, the website is a collection of primarily out of copyright material and is readily available to the film researcher. Indian Cine.ma has a framework which enables the user to select a frame, multiple frames, or a small portion of video within the timeline of a film and add comments, annotations, and link them to sub other supporting allied material for better context and understanding. Comments, annotations, and link 
them to supporting uh, supporting allied material for better context and understanding. I think that was a repeat. And an, another res researcher may have a different perspective of the same portion of the selected frames. They too could add their perspective of notes. So when the third user views these films, in addition to the viewing experience of the running film, they would be able to read the previously added annotations and comments made by both the previous scholars in the text box, which is which is a side to the film uh, film box in sync with the timeline of the movie and linked to the original selected frame or a group of frames. So Indian cine.ma I think mitigates the problem at least partially of quoting an image, at least in part to the query which Baskaran has raised. So another major thing, Baskaran has emphasized this immensely in several of his works. Why was the silent era neglected by intellectuals and writers? What is the scope of study? So Baskaran has, um, uh, Baskaran has uh, along with a few scholars, has emphasized on the lack of support by contemporary intellectuals and writers to promote the silent cinema in the writings and, and publications. This is in the 20s and 30s. There's hardly any material written about silent cinema at that time, the literary material that is available. But today it's becoming a major problem. What is the problem is that today it has become a major hurdle for the film historian to find first-hand literary sources, information or reviews of silent cinema and print form in the absence of the film itself. So now we need to ask, uh, this is an extension of my views of, on this topic. Prima facie, this has been an untouched area, relatively untouched area of study. Was the actual experience of the movie goer who watched the silent uh, cinema in the theater, was it as flowery and rosy as it is shown in reconstructed documentary films? And how is the perceived experience of the film going audience possibly connected with the attitude of the contemporary writer? I'm just trying to extrapolate and provide some ideas here. Obviously, it's a very huge uh, area of study. So what is the role of the permanent cinema hall? The permanent cinema hall uh, of the silent era, you see, the permanent silent cinema hall was not constructed exclusively for the screening of films. It is just a place for the proscenium that could allow an individual or group of individuals to address a gathering of a few hundred people, dramas, public, political, or social meetings. So there is a very interesting anonymous letter which a film goer wrote to the Hindu. Uh, this is around the year 1916 or 17. And he complains to the newspaper. He mentions the names of the theaters. The over, this is the silent. This is a silent cinema experience. And a, and a, a disgruntled film goer wrote to the Hindu. He mentions the names of the theaters, the overcrowding, the lack of sanitation, and the construction of the theaters on both sides of the Buckingham Canal. Obviously, he's referring to the pungent odor, the lack of electric fans, the claustrophobic environment, and the backdrop of the raging influenza that was raging in Madras. So this is written at a time when there was a lot of these police activities who are trying to curb crowding of people and uh, a form of trying to contain the freedom movement. So he sums up, will not therefore the commissioner of police who seems to take such anxious care about the gathering of people around Gokhale Hall, the health officer of any responsible authority interfere with the owners and insist on the proper observation of all the sanitary arrangements that might be recommended or and also take steps to prevent overcrowding effectively or entirely stop the dramas wherever these are not observed, a theater lover. He doesn't mention his name. So uh, this quote, this traumatic experience with the cine Goa face may also explain the singular possible reason of the infamous lyric theater fire, which happened a year before, a year or two before. So this is uh, an experience of uh, Vaimo Kodai Nayage a very popular writer. And uh, she, is, she has recounted it, her first experience of the silent cinema. So she said, when I was young as a child, some silent movie reels were screened in the elephant stable of our village. So you see that you just need a place. It didn't, it didn't need to have to be constrained to say that this is a place where only cinema would be screened. It could be any place. There was no electricity those days. And you can see the crowd. See, if one breathed hard, there was no way that the exhaled hair could find its way out. It was simply jam-packed. Alternatively, the place was uh, used also to store sesame seeds at, at times also. And uh, the, the cinema screening experience was filled to a point that one needed to hold their own breath. Old men of 90 years to newborn 40 days old were crushed to one another. An adult was charged an ana and a child half an ana for screening, for viewing the screening. And uh, I think this is important. She, she, she describes the scenes that she saw uh, in the village, in the, in the elephant stable. She says, point number six, the screen showed men walking, running and jumping, scenes of the running train, tidal waves of the sea, movement of the ship, 
people engaging and disengaging from the stationary train. I think she's probably referring to the Lumia brothers, the famous Lumia brothers footage. What more can I say? You know, elder men and the youngsters themselves for an anna or a half, they've shown us truly what the pleasure of heaven is. But there is an initial euphoria of seeing the silent film, yes. But over a period of time, I think one of the important things that we need to make uh, to ensure is, and probably study, was there a feeling of claustrophobia Maybe the external environment was not very good. We don't know, but this is just a hypothetical. This is again, Naradar Srinivasara, his experience of seeing the silent cinema. Again, uh, he wrote this in the 1960s. By then, he's already established as a major writer and a journalist. Again, he talks about there's an initial euphoria, but uh, he too doesn't seem to have a very bad, uh, he has a very bad experience of watching the film after the euphoria dies out. See, you, you need to, uh, there's an important point here is that the exhibitors, like unless the big chains like the Madans or maybe a, a, in a smaller proportion like the Venkayas, the most of the exhibitors had little to no choice of films. Uh, they just they just screened what they got. The Indian film screen was cheap and worn out second and third round screeners with poor quality and tons of scratches. Obviously, when such films were screened on the uh, were, uh, projected on the screen, uh, what the user saw becomes uh, a major point. It may not have been a very uh, pleasant experience. But I think one of the major important things is that the screening of films is not very remunerating. Very often, the ownership of these screening theaters would change hands often. So the screener usually had no excess money to think of improving the viewer's, viewer's visual experience or provide better sanitation facilities. Okay, and I think this is the third point. I think this is probably one of the most important points, which uh, perspective that has not uh, been touched majorly with regard to the silent cinema. It might go against the commonly accepted notion of what we perceive as a silent cinema. Five minutes. Okay. So one thing I'll just summarize. I'm running out of time. So contrary to our popular notion of uh, the films that we see in the talkies, there was a lot of sex and violence in the narrative of the average Indian silent film. This is because these filmmakers were immensely influenced by Hollywood filmmakers. And uh, you can see very popular films, Gajendra Moksham, Sarangadara, films made by General Pictures Corporation, associated films, uh, national theaters, everything had been hauled up by the censor board. A lot of these films were excised. A lot of these uh, scenes were removed. And another thing is that, see, it is also well documented that there were interim forms of entertainment in the silent cinemas, especially when reels were being changed. And uh, uh, a rather important thing is that stage dancers would come on stage for the interim entertainment. So I'm trying to ask a question here is, would conservative, uh, this may not have been uh, possibly for all silence in my experiences, but I think that it is definitely a part of a substantial amount of silence in my experiences. So would conservative rural Indian society have allowed women and children to be part of this experience? So I'm trying to raise a question here. So possibly was this the reason why the intellectual really didn't didn't uh, have a good experience of the cinema, the silent cinema? We don't know. I'm trying to skip some points here, but I think it, it's a particularly important study. Now this I think is another important thing: alternate unconventional sources for furthering South India South Indian silent film studies. So Nilal Tarunavkar, a leading journalist, spent six months studying various contemporary magazines of the silent film era. He returned disappointed saying that he wouldn't be able to find a single film review. See, geography is largely instrumental in determining sources for research and study. So a study around Tamil film, for instance, would lead the researcher to look for sources in archival centers where Tamil-speaking individuals are likely around. But the internet has changed what geography is. So I think we need to start looking at sources. But the important thing is, if, if they, there was no writer here to write about the silent film, doesn't matter. The film went to all parts of the globe. Surely there would have been other people who wrote about about these silent films. So I'm trying to look at unconventional sources here. This is a source of Bombay that uh, shows Kichakavada being screened in 1919. And I think this is particularly first. This is probably, uh, it's, a, it's a very small review of the film Kichakavadam made by Mudalya. The film went to, in 1920, to Calcutta. It is renamed Kichakbath to suit the local vernacular. Cross-verifying this uh, Calcutta censor records of this time shows that this version was not screen, uh, censored. Uh, S.B. Banerjee, who wrote this review, he was a Calcutta-based correspondent. He has also given a lot of uh, details. He's been a part of the ICC records. 
This is again another unconventional, unconventional source. This comes from Germany. Germany is talking about the South Indian Tamil silent film. It talks about Raghupati Prakash traveling in England. He's going to Calcutta. He's going to Canada, sorry. And uh, he's trying to learn about the English and American working methods. And he's the authorized representative of the Venkayan circuit of theaters. He's trying to set up to produce films under the name of Star of the East film. These records, these sensor records of the South Indian uh, films, they've been taken from uh, the Bombay and uh, Calcutta sensor records. Obviously, they would uh, li logically be uh, Madras sensor records as well, but they've not yet come to light as yet. So in the absence of those records, I'm trying to make use of the Bombay sensor records, which had screened several uh, South Indian silent films, Rose of Rajasthan, uh, uh, films by Pride of Hindustan, films made by General Pictures Corporation, Associated Films, etc. And uh, periodical reassessment of film history and emerging newer generation evidences. Uh, so over a period of time, is there a need as newer evidences emerge to reassess history of film? Uh, R. Balakrishnan, who would have been one of the who spoke earlier in the day, he makes a, a important cite, a citation in the Kiladi excavations uh, event, which was held in Madurai. He says, newer evidences should be contested and challenged uh, when a new consensus emerges, then subsequent portions of the history should be rewritten and the process should continue. Baskaran also extrapolates those works in one of his works. And uh, he also uh, echoes a similar sentiment. He says, working towards authenticity by modifying the data is a constant effort. So, so we're talking about this, what, uh, what I feel are some of the uh, aspects which will help us uh, reassess films. So if there's a, a contrary claim, what is the contrary claim? What is the evidence to substantiate the claim? Is the evidence reliable? Is the evidence available in the open space for it to be cross-examined by other individuals, researchers, and peers? And if and we can and if we can emerge at a common census by rewriting portions of film history. And uh, this, uh, so just give me two more minutes. I'll finish. I think uh, this has uh, very been a very interesting facet, which has happened uh, in the last five years. Uh, there has been a renewed interest in studying the early Tamil cinema period, particularly of the silent film era. Incidentally, I'm seeing him for the first time. Professor Vail Morgan is here. And uh, he has played a, a very important role, I feel. Uh, he has republished Chalangad Gopal Krishnan's book on film pioneer J.C. Daniel's book, uh, film Vigata Kumaran. And uh, this is the press book. This is the first time I don't think uh, there's any press book of a silent film era, which is accessible in the public space, a silent era uh, pamphlet of the famous film Vigata Kumaran. And he's translated it. He's also published a book on South Indian silent cinema 2018, uh, which contains a lot of interesting details and uh, with regard to silent films. And uh, he's also provided new information, which helps us uh, uh, reassess some of the histories around silent film, which we, uh, we know as of now. And the uh, particular thing is that, uh, do we need to historically reassess Kicha Kavadam? Now, um, uh, Well Morgan is one of those who's trying to contest Theodore Baskaran's claim that Kicha Kavadam was produced in the year 1916. Uh, so Baskaran makes this reference based on Mudalyar's original claims, and uh, this has stood its ground for a long period of time. Well Morgan claims to have personally seen a notepad of uh, Mudalyar's production company uh, with a different date and uh, he says it's with an acquaintance and stakes a claim to reassess the dates of Kicha Kavadam based on this observation. It's his personal observation, but I think such a debate around uh, an important question in establishing the origins of South Indian film history can be made if the document in question in its original paper form is brought out to the public space. This document, I think, should be subject to further investigation to a panel of senior film experts, researchers, scholars, and those uh, experienced in determining the age of ink and uh, print. So if we can, uh, after the study, and, and hopefully more documents around Kichakavadam will emerge. Hopefully, I'm, I'm very confident it will happen. Uh, we can study, and I think it's an important uh, question that needs needs to be studied, because even today, we, we, we still don't have any primary evidence that states it's either 1916, 1917, or whatever. But I hope uh, more evidences will come. And this, uh, this is uh, K.A. Davies and K.A. Francis, uh, the forgotten Kunhapu brothers. Kunapa Anthony Davis and Kunapa Anthony Francis, they were bankers, film financiers, exhibitors, and film distributors. They were instrumental in building several surviving institutions in Trishore, and their role continues to be acknowledged locally even today. Uh, but I think what was most important about the brothers was that they had provided the seed capital to finance A. Narayanan's General Pictures Corporation, which is the second largest uh, film production center of silent, uh, South Indian silent cinema. And uh, 
I think uh, the space which is coming up in the last five years, there are other young non-academic scholars showing interest in the space. Manu Satish is currently researching independent profiles of film actors and technicians of the talkies of the 30s. Muthu Vail has brought out a book on forgotten filmmaker T.C. Vadivel Naikar. Tirupur Akila Vijay Kumar is also actively studying the songs of the early talkie period and th of Tamil cinema. Uh, Kavinir Ponchala Muthu is also playing his small part in this thing. Uh, but uh, I want to summarize by saying one thread among these individuals is common. Almost all of these individuals mentioned above and those who will spring up in the future to make a contribution to Tamil film studies would at some point be influenced by the writings and contributions of Theoda Bhaskaran in this field of study and research. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sugit, for the wonderful note. Uh, it assures us that generations of future scholars will continue to take the touch forward and will remain indebted to and influenced by Theodore's work. On that uh, reassuring note, uh, let's break.